Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 213. Let's see here. Today, we are going to be talking about, of course, what always comes up around the first of the year, which is Roots Tech. It's actually going to be a little later this year. It's going to be towards the end of February. It's the biggest genealogy conference in the United States, probably the world. And it happens in Salt Lake City every year. We've got news from Roots Tech. Michael will be here with the Military Minutes and a super helpful explanation of the difference between different kinds of military services. I get these mixed up too. There's regulars, there's volunteers, there's militia. He's going to sort all that out for us. And finally, if there's one word that sums up what you can expect to see more of online this year, that word is video. Online video is the fastest growing area on the internet. It's how we're learning, it's how we're sharing, and how we are going to reach and inspire the next generation to take that special care of all the work that we've done and keep it moving forward. Facebook, Instagram, they are all focusing the majority of their efforts into video. I mean, have you noticed that on Facebook, if you share a video, it seems to get a lot more traction, more likes, sometimes more than the text posts and photos that you might be posting. That's because Facebook ranks video as a top priority, and it puts it at the top of the list when it's deciding what to funnel to your friends and families into their news feeds. But video can be daunting. I get that. And creating it is not for everyone. Well, recently, I helped out one longtime listener to bring his family history poem that he wrote to video. And I'm going to share that journey with you. Uh, You'll remember the Where I'm From poems that we did in the last year or two. Tom Boyer is going to be here. He's going to be sharing his journey on writing the poem, what it meant to him, the process. And then I'll tell you about how we took that poem and turned it into video and some tips for you so that you can find a way to join the video revolution in a way that you're comfortable with. So first, let's jump right into it. There's lots of news. Another great keynote speaker has been announced for Roots Tech 2018. Henry Louis Gates Jr. is going to speak on Saturday, March 3rd of 2018. Now, you may know him as the host of the PBS television series, Finding Your Roots, an author and the force behind several great family history and genealogy themed documentaries. He's also been here on the show in the past. I'll have a link in our webpage show notes for this episode. Again, episode number 213. You can always get to the show notes page for everything that we're going to be talking about today by going to genealogygems.com and clicking on the menu under podcast. You're going to Genealogy Gems Podcast. Right there, you'll see links to all the episodes. Just click 213. I hope if you are considering a trip to Salt Lake City and perhaps attending the Roots Tech Conference, like I know so many of you are, come by and see us. I'll be there. I'll be teaching classes and teaching a brand new class together with my dear friend and DNA expert, Diane Southard. This is going to be incredible. She's going to be talking about, of course, DNA testing, getting the most out of your matches. I'm going to be helping the audience finally figure out how to get family tree information for people who are on their match list who do not have or have not uploaded a family tree to the DNA testing site. Isn't that one of your biggest pain points? It is for me. It is for her. When she told me about this, I said, I've got some ideas. I think we can get some workarounds here. We're going to be debuting that class at Roots Tech 2018. So I'm very excited about that. We will also be in the exhibit hall. So be sure and come by The best way to do that is to dig in your hand into that bag they give you when you register and pull out the flyer that we are going to stuff in every single bag that has our schedule. And then you can come on by the Genealogy Gems booth. 
we are going to be in a little different spot this year. We're going to be right as you enter the main doors, kind of near up where Find My Past and Ancestry are. You will see Genealogy Gems and our theater there. We'll have a large booth space. And I've got all the details for you over at the website. So check out genealogygems.com slash roots tech. And even if you're not going, I recommend that you go check it out because we do do our in booth training sessions, kind of our power sessions. And we've been doing this the last couple of years. We're going to have more information as we get closer to Roots Tech at the end of February about how we're going to get some of that material to you this year. So I'm very excited about that. Hey, talking about video. And that's what it's going to be about. So we will have some very exclusive video coming to you from the floor of the Roots Tech Exhibit Hall. It's going to be an awesome time. Now, in Genealogy Gems news, I have a couple things for you. Okay, I'm a woman, and I reserve the right to change my mind at any time. <laughs> if you're a woman, you know what I'm talking about. If you're a man, you know what I'm talking about, because you've certainly heard this. So our plan in 2017, I was really, really hoping last fall, I said, I want to do two episodes of the free show each month. And part of that was because some of the episodes were getting a little bit longer, and I wanted to keep them a little tighter. Well, remember what I said at the beginning of this episode? Video is where it's at. That's how people have been telling us overwhelmingly they want to see it hear it, (laughs) and read it. They want to learn in all those different ways. So it it really came down to manpower, woman power here at at, uh, the Genealogy Gems headquarters, and talking about how we're going to spend our efforts, our time, our energies, how we can best meet your needs. It finally dawned on us, it's not through the additional podcast episode, but it's actually being more consistent with video. Now, those of you with a premium membership, you're you're getting some awesome videos that you're seeing. We make a huge effort on those. I want to make sure that we're also getting free videos out on our YouTube channel. And so in order to really cover everybody where they're at and the ways they can learn, we really felt like that was the way to go to meet your needs. Yep, I changed my mind. We're not doing a second um, free episode each month. You're going to get a full length course episode every month as you always have for the last 10 years and that will continue on. And boy, have we got some great stuff lined up for 2018. But I also want to encourage you to uh, take advantage of video. See, the thing is, if you're not used to initially turning to video to, to learn something or get an answer to something or listen to something, it can feel awkward. Like, well, I don't think about going to YouTube or whatever. Well, the good news is we're going to make this easier and easier for you. And I think what you're going to find is when you do click through on that video, you're going to find that not only can you hear it, but you can watch it, see it. And there is something about that that really helps solidify what you're learning. And with videos, we will still have occasionally downloadable handouts. We certainly have all the backup information in the video description. So you've got text there to read and refer to as well. I think that you're going to find that uh, we can accomplish things even faster by doing video as well. Sometimes what it takes to explain in an audio format is twice as long as it just to show you and tell you at the same time. So I encourage you to embrace using video and tapping into the video that we provide here for you as a way to keep abreast of things. If you do visit my YouTube channel on a regular basis, which I hope you do, you're probably finding this podcast publishes as a video on YouTube. Now, this happens automatically through our system. So what you get is a picture of the logo, and then you can just listen to the show. But for many people, just turning on the YouTube video and letting it play in the background as they do other things on their phone or in the the house, you know, whatever they're doing, that is a very convenient way to listen. And actually, we've reached a lot of people that way who didn't even know that there was such a thing as a genealogy podcast out there. I've been amazed at the number of viewers, if you will, people who are listening to the podcast through a YouTube video. So it's growing. And um, I just want to make sure that you knew and weren't looking for an episode or thinking it fell off your feed. I think you're going to find that it's important to have our Genealogy Gems app 
on your phone because many of our videos will be delivered to you. That extra content we're working on is going to come to you in the form of video on your bonus content and also then on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't been over there, just ignore all the cat videos and everything else that goes on at YouTube and go straight to youtube.com slash genealogy gems. Or I said I was making it easier for you. Head to genealogygems.com and you'll find on the brand new website, which I am so excited about. It's pretty. I'm very happy about that. Uh, It's been a long road and we're still fixing things. So uh, you guys have been awesome about letting me know if you find something that isn't working, send me an email, we'll fix it. The homepage scrolls down. There's lots of great stuff to take in just there on the homepage. But on the first part, upper part of the screen, you'll see click for more gems. One click to follow me on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and yes, YouTube, as well as Instagram, which is my, I told you before, it's one of my favorite places to be. I've been probably posting way more on Instagram than Facebook lately. It's really super easy. You can follow us on our YouTube channel right there from our webpage. So you don't even have to go to YouTube and go, you know, scurrying around trying to find us. Just click through on the YouTube button on the red bar on the homepage, and that will get you there. So that is the news there. And I mentioned to you that we do have a new premium video. One of the things we did was I updated the making Evernote effortless video. Some of the Evernote videos, you know, all the concepts are all the same, but my gosh, software, they keep changing it, right? So I went in and I updated the making Evernote effortless video. I think you'll love it if you haven't seen it. And you can certainly go back and get a refresher if you have seen it. This is going to help you learn how to collect information all in one place in Evernote, organize projects and to-do lists to accomplish more of your family history. You know, we don't have any extra time, so we're going to have to find ways to be more efficient and get things done faster in a more organized way. That's what this does. And also in that video, we talk about finding the information that you need through keyword searches, taking notes anywhere on any device, and protecting your research by syncing it to the cloud through Evernote. So it's a terrific class. It's going to up your skills real quick. Um, The new one that's coming, I believe it is time travel technology. I had a blast putting this together. This video is about some of the awesome ways that tech is reaching history and family history and genealogy, and I think could be used for that. You just have to go check it out. I don't think you've seen anything like this before. It is called time travel travel technology. And uh, as soon as this episode gets up and running, I believe that will be live on the website. So lots to look forward to there. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. You've probably found wonderful old photos and documents in your research, but That's not exactly exciting stuff to your kids and your grandkids. The truth is, the non-genealogists in our families aren't captivated by the same things we are. But you can change all that with Animoto.com. Start creating fabulous videos about your family history that they won't be able to resist. 
And you don't have to have any special skills. With Animoto, you drag and drop your files in, like photos and even video clips. Pick from their professional styles and huge music catalog and Voila! You've got an awesome video. I've made dozens of these and my family loves them. Hey, my grandson didn't mention the Legos that I gave him for his birthday, but he did thank me for the video that I made. You've got to try this out for yourself. Visit Animoto.com. Italian attention, right, dress, front, right shoulder, arms, forward, march. Hello, listeners. We've mustered in for another episode of Military Minutes with Michael Strauss. Last month, we finished our tour looking at both the compiled military service records and the OMPF files. No doubt words like regulars volunteers, and militia appeared in various papers. This month, we will explore the different types of enlistments. Regulars were those men who enlisted for a specific period of time as part of the standing army. These men could have enlisted during a war period or peacetime. During the colonial period, they may have been recorded with other names, as either the Continental Line or part of the Flying Camp. The latter were men who served directly under General George Washington. Now, volunteers were men who served during wartime or any period of emergency whose service was considered to be in the interest of the federal government. Recorded from the Revolutionary War onward, these men at the time might have also been listed as associators. They are not to be confused with militia. Volunteers were not subject to fines for non-service. Like the regulars, these records can be found at the National Archives. A good example of the difference between regulars and volunteers can be found during the Spanish-American War of 1898. During that war, there was a regular Army 1st U.S. Cavalry that served alongside the volunteer 1st U.S. Cavalry. The latter was known as the Rough Riders, led by Colonel Theodore Roosevelt. Lastly were the men who enlisted in the militia, organized by state and oftentimes at the county level. Militia were generally men called up for limited military duty between the ages of 17 and 60, as needed for the common defense. They were often required to serve for a period of time based on the local militia laws on the books. The men were subject to fines and penalties for non-service. Records of the militia are going to be found at your local state archives. Now, taking one war period as an example, one of my ancestors, Samuel Howard, served during the Civil War. Because of his age, he wasn't able to enlist until 1865 when he turned 18. He was a volunteer soldier who served as a substitute for another man. After his discharge, he again enlisted, this time in the regular army, in 1866, and was assigned to the 13th U.S. Infantry, where he served one month before deserting at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. Now, his regular army military service, even though brief, was completely unknown to me until just a couple of years ago. When he applied for his Civil War pension that was granted to him, he never mentioned his regular army service. Samuel lived in Pennsylvania from the end of the Civil War until his death in 1913. He was married in 1867, as this may have had some significance to his actions. I believe the key to finding your ancestors, whether they served in the regulars, the volunteers, or militia, is to look at not only the federal records, but to search your local state records, as the latter may be the only place you'll find proof of military service. Now, listeners, you're dismissed until next month when we'll again muster in and discuss the different military branches, when each was organized and any predecessor agencies or organization when formed. Until next time. Okay, have you visited backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. 
your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all of that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7, automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. MyHeritage.com is your home for global genealogy research. The site boasts the most geographically diverse membership in the world, with a strong presence in many European countries. Search for cousin connections worldwide among more than 86 million people on a site that operates in over 40 languages. Powerful proprietary search technologies at MyHeritage.com dig deeper and with greater accuracy into billions of historical records and online trees. This is the only major genealogy website that offers automated hinting on possible matches in digitized historical newspapers. And now MyHeritage offers autosomal DNA testing too. They're jumpstarting their DNA database by inviting members to upload their own and by sponsoring tests in certain parts of the world. I'm looking forward to the geographical diversity I anticipate from their DNA data. So head on over to myheritage.com and expand your global genealogy research. That's myheritage.com. It's funny how some ideas curl up in the back of your mind and take root. Even when there is a darn good reason to take action right now, some ideas just need to marinate a bit, turning over and over, refusing to be rushed. Oh, but when they are ready to get cooked up, they can really sizzle and we can sit back satisfied that it was worth the wait. Tom Boyer first heard the idea of writing as sort of family history poem on Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 185, which was first published in November 2015. In that episode, the poet laureate of Kentucky, George Ella Lyon, shared her poem of family identity. It was called Where I'm From, a poem that inspired many folks in her home state to do the same thing. Where I'm from, I am from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I am from the dirt under the back porch, black, glistening. It tasted like beets. I am from the forsythia bush, the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I'm from fudge and eyeglasses, from Imogene and Alifair. I'm from the know-it-alls, and the pass-it-ons from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restoreth my soul with the cotton ball lamb and ten verses I can say myself. I'm from Artemis and Billy's Branch, fried corn and strong coffee, from the finger my grandfather lost to the auger, the eye my father shut, to keep his sight. Under my bed was a dress box spilling old pictures, a sift of lost faces to drift beneath my dreams. I am from those moments, snapped before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree. Such a simple idea. 
looking back over your life and putting down on paper the things that mattered most, the things that make you, you, and that shed light on the family from which you came. The poem inspired me to not only write my own version of the poem, but to hold a contest, which I hoped would inspire my listeners to take a turn putting pen to paper and writing their own Where I'm From poem. And yes, folks do still use pen and paper, don't they? Tom liked the idea, but like so many, he found it challenging. Ever since you had that little contest on your podcast, I've had this idea in the back of my head on doing that thing. I had all these ideas. I think of myself as being a a visualizer, but not much of an actualizer. So (laughs) I had all these visions in my head on what I wanted to do, but I never did get around to doing it. Until one day I thought, you know, I'm just going to give it a try. And I wrote down on a piece of paper kind of some of the things I thought were areas that I should talk a little bit about and I didn't want it to get too long so I thought well you know there's me there's my wife's family and then there's the things that were kind of important to me I've been my military service Mm -hmm. and uh, probably my military service even though I was reservist um, for most of my career I still have a higher regard for what I did in the Navy than I did what I did working for state government but uh I didn't put anything in there about working for state agencies or anything. But then uh, the family is always important, and it wasn't too hard to bring in the two brother-in-laws. Mm-hmm. They came in pretty easy for me. So interesting that the exercise of writing a poem like that where you're thinking over your life, it sounds like it pretty quickly the cream rises to the top in terms of what you have really valued personally. Yeah, it did for me, I think, yeah. Yeah. So that poem kept marinating. By the conclusion of the contest, several of you had sent in your poems, and they were truly wonderful. And yet I knew that what we received was just a tiny fraction of our listeners. But that's okay. Good ideas so often have their own timetable. Fast forward to August of 2017 long after our Where I'm From poetry contest had ended, an email appeared in my inbox with the simple subject line of Where I'm From. In it was Tom's poem, and it was wonderful. In fact, I thought it was so terrific that I twisted his arm and I got him to record it. From there, I added a little music magic to it, and then I featured it on the September podcast episode. This is a poem I wrote in response to a article on the Genealogy Gems podcast from several episodes ago, great article about writing your short little history in a poem form. It's called uh, Where I'm From. Home means Nevada. Home means the hills. Home means the sage and the pines. Nevada State Song. I'm from the indescribable rain-fresh smell of Nevada sagebrush out towards Pyramid Lake. Land of blue-bellied lizards basking in the sun and a donkey named Bambi. Riding a yellow school bus 20 miles each way, stopping at the Mustang River Ranch to get my buddy. Mom would never let me play at his house. I'm from a diesel submarine and a smirched trip off Vietnam. 80 shipmates, a dozen or so I remember today. And another 20 plus years as a Navy Reserve Officer. Hundreds of shipmates, Seabees, few of them I can remember. I'm from my high school sweetheart's family. A father-in-law I never knew. A mother-in-law who was amazingly upbeat regardless of the hand she was dealt. Three sisters-in-law who were more like daughters and a brother-in-law, taken from us much too early, cancer. Finally, I'm from my own clan, parents of the greatest generation who lived a depression in a world war, keepers of the American dream, an older sister to keep me in line, a younger brother to pester. 
extended family that includes yet another brother-in-law taken from us much too early. Cancer. Two of my own and their four offspring. Keepers of where I'm from. Tom Boyer in Olympia, Washington. Thanks a lot. When I asked Tom how he got started when he sat down to write his poem, he said it really boiled down to answering two questions. Just where am I from? And what or who in my life had profound influence in who I am today? For Tom, it was living in Nevada as a kid, represented by lizards and his donkey Bambi, who Tom says would do anything for him if it included a chocolate mud pie. The Navy, his family, his wife's family, and the family that she and Tom created. Tom emailed me after it aired, and he said he loved the addition of the music. And after watching our webinar from New York a couple of months ago, he decided he really wanted to try his hand at using the video creation tool Animoto to turn it into a video, since he had photos of most of what he mentioned in the poem. I couldn't think of a more splendid idea. So I sent him an MP3 audio file of the finished version, set to music, and I made him promise that he would let me see his video when he was done. Two months passed, and one day I was looking through some of my computer files, and I stumbled into that recording, and it occurred to me that I hadn't heard from Tom, which probably meant he hadn't made his video after all. It was understandable. Making a video for the first time can seem daunting, and life has a real way of slipping in and getting in the way, doesn't it? It became clear even when you have great material to work with, the audio already set to music, the photographs already digitized, it can still be daunting to take it to the next step of turning it into a video. Maybe you felt that way too. Well, I know how I am. I feel more motivated and confident when I can see the goal that I'm aiming for. So what I needed to do became very clear. I needed to offer to make the video for him. Then he could see how worthwhile it really was, and perhaps it could serve as an inspiration to others of you who have thought about making a family history video. So I reached back out to Tom and I made the offer. He quickly replied with a resounding, absolutely. He said he had already pulled together many photos representing the people and places that he mentions in the poem, which he did when he first thought about making a video, but ultimately he'd ran into a couple of obstacles. Everything that I sent to you and that I still probably have several hundred more, Mm -hmm. I've already digitized and I have filed. So when it came time for, you know, my Navy photos, I just opened up my Navy file and I looked through them and thought, well, this one looks kind of good. And, uh, and all the family pictures, those are all digitized. So it was easy. That part was easy. I had to, Google for blue belly lizards and Mustang River Ranch, but other than that, uh, I pretty much had a lot of the other photos already. So, Tom put the photos he had collected in the same order as the subjects were mentioned in the poem. Simple enough to do just by putting a number in front of the name of each file. And then he saved them in a Dropbox folder and shared the direct link to the folder with me. You can get a Dropbox account for free, or you can use any cloud file sharing service that allows you to share files with others. He seemed relieved that I had offered. Our own story is the most personal one that we can tell, and Tom confessed that he can get choked up even now just by listening to his own poem, especially the parts about the brothers-in-law that he loved and lost too young to cancer. To get this done, I enlisted the help of Hannah, our resident video whiz here at Genealogy Gems. She pulled Tom's photos from Dropbox into the Animoto video tool, which you've heard, of course, me talk about here on the show, and uploaded the audio file, that MP3 file, of the poem that was set to music. Animoto has a template for almost any occasion, so that makes it pretty easy. 
For this video, Hannah used Tom's collection of photos that inspired his story and made sure that they were in the order of his narration. You'll find when using the video templates, though, that timing the photos to pre-recorded narration can pose some real challenges. Originally, when she put the photos in place and previewed the video, the narration didn't line up at all with the images. So creating videos is a lot of fun, but there are some challenges that can go along with it. We talk about Animoto here on the podcast quite a bit, and this is a tool that I use often. I want to share with you a challenge that I have run into, and I hope that I can give you some ideas on how to make your videos just stand out. When I was in creator mode, I selected a picture that I wanted to appear longer on the screen, and then I clicked the spotlight button. So spotlight is a feature that highlights the selected item of your choice, and it adds a few more seconds to its length. This feature is located on the left-hand side in the editor column. Or you can also double click the image and that will open into a larger single view and you can select the star button, which will do the same thing. Part of my process of editing my projects is previewing the video over and over. Um, this helps me make decisions on which photos I want to be spotlighted in the order that they're in. Now, one of my problems was not just with a few photos, but I didn't like the overall timing of my video. So I went up to the right hand corner and I clicked the edit song slash trim and pacing button. Here I can trim the uploaded mp3 audio that I have as well as the pace to which the photos appear. The trouble that I had was that my photos appeared just too fast on the screen in comparison to the narration that I had. I just didn't like it. So I moved the pace button to the left to try to change the pacing of it all. I previewed the video one last time and this did the trick. My end result was a heartwarming poem turned into a visually beautiful story. Even with her expertise, it took Hannah several hours to complete the video. And once it was done, it was amazing. I'll have the video on the show notes webpage for this episode, as well as on our YouTube channel so that you can watch it yourself. It is inspirational. And I really hope you'll take a few extra moments and do just that. So I was really anxious to share it with Tom and see what he thought. So I made arrangements with him to jump on a call and record his reaction. And it was really an uncanny coincidence that the day the video was done, and the day that we made that call, it just happened to be the third anniversary of the passing of his beloved brother-in-law, John. Today's kind of a tough day for yeah. for us, but I'd well, like to take a look at it. And then, yes. um because I want to share it with, with the rest of my family. Well, wonderful. Let's, See what let's do that then. Okay. I got her up on the screen and hit the go button. Home means Nevada. Home means the hills. Home means the sage and the pines. They're my own and they're for offspring. Keepers of where I'm from. Tom Boyer in Olympia, Washington. Thanks a lot. I hope it captured the feeling that you have of your family. And I liked the uh, style that she chose and that it, it did feel like memories to me. Yeah. Yeah, you guys did a great job. It's kind of hard to reach through the telephone to give you a hug. But that's it. <laughs> I'll take one anyway. Here you go. Yeah. I'm so glad you like it. You have such a beautiful family and, uh, the joy on all those kids' faces and your family, and clearly you and your wife are so close. And I think it's it was fun for me to finally get to see the pictures of the things I'd heard you say in the in the poem several times. Yeah, yeah. No, she did. She did great. I, I'd give her a go if she was here. <laughs> well, I hope you feel like that. This is something that you would enjoy sharing with your family and. Um, 
you know, I hope that it's something that you guys can, can enjoy together over the holidays too. Yeah. It's a great gift you gave me. Well, I think the gift that you're giving everybody and everybody who's going to hear this on the show is that you got out there and took action when you talked about visualizing something or thinking about doing a poem and most all of us have such wonderful intentions and yet when i look at the faces of the people in your video like i've got if i've got your brother-in-law's picture up on the screen right now i think to myself how it's only action that ensures that that people aren't forgotten they're all depending on us you know all of our ancestors are depending on us and um, so that's what I just so admire about the fact that you took a risk and not only created it, but that you shared it with me and with the other gems out there listening. I really do appreciate that, Tom. Well, it was um, something I had. Some Something told me I should probably do that. Just uh, I don't know why I did it, but I'm, I'm glad I did. And I hope uh, if anybody watches it, they enjoy it. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, family history is kind of personal. So, like, you would never know that my mother-in-law was diagnosed with uh, MS early in life. And she actually gave birth to her twin daughters while she was in a treatment in an iron lung. They thought she had polio. Oh, my word. My wife's family story is really, could make a a tremendous, tragic saga of of family tragedies that they overcame. Her her dad, for example, the guy in the Navy uniform, he was, I never knew him. He died in the airplane crash uh, two weeks before the twin girls were born. So, and at that time, the mother, Julie's mom, was already in the wheelchair. So she, my wife basically raised, she was a matriarch of the family for quite a few years. And then I came along and we just took over whatever chores needed to be taken over. So mm-hmm. that's why those uh, three girls are more like my own kids because they moved in with us when they were probably... 10 or 11, something like that. So, I mean, that's when you look at the pictures, uh, when people look at the video and they see the pictures up there, there's deeper stories behind each person. And that's kind of kind of the way it is, I think, in everybody's family. The picture yes. only shows you the face and maybe a hint or two of the personality, but doesn't tell you the life struggles that they went through in the life, you know, all the great things in life, too. So not just struggles, but mm-hmm. all the great things. So. Well, anyway, you got me totally emotionalized for the whole day now. So. <laughs> Sorry, but I but I appreciate you uh, being willing to go there. And I hope that seeing it in this format, taking your poem one step further even, will encourage everybody to, yeah. you know, persevere yeah. and re- and record those deeper stories. Like you said, you can't possibly cover it all in two minutes, but it sure shows you how powerful just a few minutes can be and how worthwhile it is to do it. I hope you'll show it to your mom. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so, Tom. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll do that. Then I can't tell you. I'm... I'm sorry, it broke <laughs> up. I didn't hear what you said. Yeah. I didn't say anything because I was choked up. Oh, sweetie. <laughs> but I appreciate it. You're so welcome. Okay. Thank you, sweetheart. All right. All right. I'll talk to you I'll later. I'll be talking with you later. That sounds Bye, Lisa. Good. Bye. Bye. And so this idea of a poem that took root in Tom's mind did turn into a video after all. So do you have a darn good reason to take action right now to get your family history in front of your family? Perhaps a video of the loving couples in your family tree for Valentine's Day, 
or a video of your family's traditional Easter egg hunt through the years. Um, How about a tribute to the moms, young and old, in your family on Mother's Day? Your child's or your grandchild's graduation in June. A video to promote your upcoming family reunion to get folks really visualizing the fun that they're going to have. Or perhaps it's a story of a genealogy journey that you've been on where you have really busted a brick wall and retrieved an ancestor's memory from being lost forever. All of these can be lovely, wonderful opportunities to share the family history with your family in a way that they can really appreciate. And as I said at the top of the show, Facebook is going to show you much more love when you post a video than when you simply post text or a photo. It's going to head to the top of your friends and family's news feeds. And Facebook is really where the next generation can be found. So I've got four great options for you to quickly get videos made and out in front of your family. Number one, have you got an iPhone? Hey, iOS 10 now has memories. It's a feature of your Photos app. You might have seen it there at the bottom of the screen in between the Photos and Albums icon, uh, but kind of wondered what it was. Well, it's not very sophisticated, but it is a super easy way to make a video right now with no more waiting, particularly of an event where you took several photos. So it's going to be able to see the photos that you took kind of grouped together, typically by date, and it will set it to music. It'll turn it instantly. You don't even have to hardly do anything. Uh, if you don't like the music, I think you can even change it. So the memories feature is one really fast way to do it right there on your phone. Number two, there's the free Adobe Spark video app, which you can download to both iOS and Android. And you can add photos, video clips, and text to your project. Uh, Pick a theme, add a music track from their collection. They've got several to choose from. And you can whip up something pretty impressive in a really short period of time. Number three, of course, there's Animoto, which does everything that Spark does, but it gives you even more control over the content and most importantly, the ability to download your video in HD quality. That is really key uh, for long-term preservation and enjoyment. I think having that HD video on your own computer and backed up to the cloud is really the way to go for, for long-term storage. And in addition to this HD quality video that you can download from Animoto, you can even add a button to the end of your video that the viewer can tap and it will take them to any website you want to take them to. So it could take them to your Genealogy Society website or a Facebook group for your family reunion or even a document that you found on Family Search. It is a really cool kind of next level up tool. And number four, Finally, if you have the idea and you pull together the photos, but you just feel like this is not your gig, (laughs) I get that. It's not for everybody, but video is for everybody. It's just that we don't all necessarily have the time or inclination or skill set or patience to make videos. Uh, You heard from my daughter, Hannah, who was the genius behind putting together Tom's video, just using the MP3 poem that he recorded and the photos. And I don't even know that he gave her very much text to work with. She, he just put the photos in the order of what he talked about in the audio. Well, Hannah is going to start offering a video creation service for those of you who this is just not your thing. So she can take your ideas and your photos and create a video just like she did for Tom. See, to all of us here at Genealogy Gems, the most important thing is that your ideas come to life. And your family history can be treasured and shared so that it brings joy to your life and also your future generations. The thing is, if your kids and your grandkids can see the value of your genealogy research, they're going to be more motivated to preserve and protect it. It doesn't have to be fancy. You could use memories. You could use the Adobe Spark video app. You could take it up a notch and use Animoto. Or you can hire Hannah to create a video for you. Whatever way works for you, that's the key. 
If you're interested in learning more about booking Hannah to create your family history video, you can contact her through the contact form on our homepage at genealogygems.com or email her at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And we'll tell you more about that uh, in the future as well as the service kind of gets off the ground and eventually we'll have a, a landing page for it so that you can probably buy it right through the store. No matter which route you decide to go to create video, here are five steps to just kickstart your video. So number one, pick one family history topic. Just decide what it's going to be about. Is it going to be about the Cook family who lived in England and the fact that they made the decision to move to America? Is it going to be just a recap of the naval history of your father-in-law like I did with mine? Is it going to be a recap of last year's family reunion to entice people to come to this year's family reunion? Whatever it is, just put down the top of your paper, what's the subject? Number two, write the topic in one brief sentence. This is going to be the title of your video, okay? So keep it nice and simple, uh, but really let people know. It doesn't have to be all artsy and creative. Let people know kind of what they're about, the story they're about to hear. So try to write that in one sentence. Number three, select 12 photographs that represent your topic. Now you can flex that. You can make it 10 or you can make it 14, but I'm I'm trying to give you a nice amount for about the size of video and length of video that we did for Tom. Um, The idea here is is that most video that you're going to want to share on social media, you don't want it to be more than three minutes. On Instagram, it's perfect to have it one minute. But on Facebook, I think you can get away with about three, or you could put this on your YouTube channel, or you could just have it on your computer and email it to people. Um, But even emailing is going to be a lot easier if it's short. And frankly, everybody's attention span is short. (laughs) So we want to get a video made. So let's keep this nice and brief, maybe no more than three minutes. That's about the length of a song. So pick the 12 photos, even if it just means going through your photo album and pulling out the pictures to scan them or whether it's picking them on your computer, you want 12. Now, number four, on a piece of paper, I want you to number it one to 12, okay? Write one brief sentence about each photo that conveys the story, conveys your message. Now, you don't have to have text for every photo, not by any means, But I don't think it hurts to just challenge yourself to write one simple sentence for each one. Why did you pick this photo? Who's in it? What's happening? What's the story here? And you may find that when you go to make the video, you don't want to have text on every one of them, but you'll have that option. If you have real troubles writing up a sentence for one of the pictures, you may find, well, maybe that's not the right picture for this, and I'll go pick something else. This just gives you a little structure so that you've got the text at hand when you're ready to go. Number five, scan the photos if they aren't already scanned. And again, save them all to one folder on your computer. If you already have the pictures on your computer, I want you to copy them and put them in this folder. We're not going to use the original images, even if it's digital. I just think we're safer when we leave our uh, high quality scanned images where they are stored and preserved and archived on your computer, hopefully backed up to the cloud. And you're going to copy those into a project folder. And that just keeps it nice and simple. Now, you'll want that in some kind of cloud sharing service. Uh, I use Dropbox. That's easy. It's free. If you don't use Dropbox, you can even just sign up and get a free Dropbox account with a a small amount of basic storage. That's going to be enough to be able to have them on your computer and be able to access them through the Dropbox app on a phone or a laptop or any other device. So that way, if you decide you want to do it, through memories and bring them into your photos app. If you want to do it through the Adobe app, you'll be ready to go. But you'll also have them in one place if right there on your desktop computer, you decide to work with Animoto and do it that way. Um, And also uh, the way that you'll be able to share it with Hannah, if you decide you'd like to have it done for you, is you can send her and share a link of that folder to her so she can grab the pictures and turn them into a video. That's how we did it for Tom. So now with those five steps, you're in great shape. 
you're ready to go to take the next step and get your video made in a way that suits your interest, your skill, and your time. I hope you've enjoyed traveling this story road with Tom and with us, and I hope you're inspired to cook up some ideas for how you can use video to share the amazing work that you are doing in genealogy. It's never too late, my friend, to try to start. And you, like Tom, will enjoy being able to sit back, satisfied that it was worth the wait. As we wrap up this episode, I want to give credit to my production staff. But before I do, I just wanted to tell you not to tune out because just before the end of this episode, I'm going to play a snippet from an interview that I think that you'll like. We have a very special author coming on the show, Sylvia Brown, and I just want to play a little teaser for you to hear what's coming up soon on the next premium podcast episode. Thank you so much to Sonny Morton, our contributing editor with additional content by Military Minutes contributor Michael Strauss. The team also includes Vienna Thomas, our associate audio producer, audio editor Hannah Fullerton, and service manager Lacey Cook. of us at some point find ourselves at a unique crossroads. It's when our modern sensibilities and beliefs sort of crash into the lives of our ancestors who lived at a very different time in history, perhaps conducting their lives in ways that we wouldn't dream of. Well, author Sylvia Brown experienced this and she covers it in a fascinating new book. It's called Grappling with Legacy. And it takes an in-depth look at her American family, the Brown family, and its accumulation of great wealth, its 300-year philanthropic activities, and the motivations behind its multi-generation compulsion for giving. She has engaged in years of research, and she sifted through that mountain of uncovered information in order to tell their story. Sylvia Brown is here today to talk about that experience and her book. Welcome to the show, Sylvia. It's great to be here, Lisa. Thanks for a great introduction. You're one of the best introductions I've received so far. (laughs) Well, happy to do so. It's quite a book. And I'm always so impressed when anybody manages to put it all together. You know, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, for anybody who's, who's looking into their family. But the beginning is always a really good place to start. So... Uh, I'd love to know, what was the impetus for writing Grappling with Legacy? The impetus was actually an event that took place uh, 14 years ago when Brown University appointed the first African-American president of an Ivy League university. And the first thing she did when taking office was to create a committee on slavery and justice to look at the origins of the university. And I sat in a packed auditorium at the first public forum of this committee. And I must uh, take a step back and say that I grew up in a family steeped in philanthropy. It's very much in our DNA. And although we never sat around the dinner table Uh, discussing uh, our ancestors and bragging to ourselves about what we'd done. It was very much uh, an atmosphere of admiration and respect for our ancestors that I grew up in. And here I sat in the packed auditorium and a speaker got up on stage and said, there were no good browns. And I took that like a punch in the stomach. I wondered if I had been fed a pack of lies growing up, if they were skeletons in our closet that I didn't know about. And so I decided to investigate what the story was 
about my 18th century ancestors and see if, in fact, uh, I came from a long line of horrible people or whether 21st century values were being imposed on people who lived 300 years ago, just as you said in your introduction. It's interesting. I mean, you know, when somebody uses a broad brush like that, you're already in trouble because anybody who's done research for a while knows their family is not all one thing. And it's certainly not all one thing for 300 years. Indeed. And what happened to me is that I focused on the 18th century ancestors, but very quickly I discovered that there are actually 11 generations of Browns before me. And they, each generation has a very interesting story. And I moved quickly on from the 18th century ancestors to look at the 17th and 19th and 20th centuries. And I discovered all sorts of fascinating trends, personalities, uh, changing values, interesting relationships between fathers and sons. And soon this great fresco appeared. And that's what I wanted to write about in the end. Fascinating. When you titled the book, it's clear to me when you use a word like grappling, you've really thought about each word in your title and what you're trying to convey. Um, Is it this contradiction? Is it this uh, punch in the gut that you got that you're grappling with? Or is there even more behind that title? There's even more behind it. Because Uh, There was a lot of attention paid by the university and the media on the 18th century and on slavery. Uh, And I must add, my ancestors were successful merchants in an Atlantic economy that was fueled by the slave trade. Everyone in New England in the 18th century was exposed to the slave trade in one way or another. But in the 19th century, there was industrialization and the Browns built the first textile factory in America and Rhode Island was known for employing children. And so child labor is one of the sins of the 19th century. And one could look at my earliest ancestors and talk about land being taken from the indigenous people. You know, there there are many, many skeletons in our closets, if that's what you really care about. I say we should look and learn from the past, but we really should be worrying about the problems of the present. For example, the fact that there are 40 million slaves in the world today, and what are we doing about trafficking in modern-day slavery? I hope you enjoyed Genealogy Gems podcast episode 213. Learn more about us at genealogygems.com. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.